This is the most requested video I've had so far. The electrical system. So in this video, I'm gonna go through the complete electrical system in our van. I'm gonna break it down into the key components and try and explain it as simply as possible. So pretty much anyone with a very simple electrical knowledge can understand. At the end of this video, if you still have any questions, don't forget to leave a comment. And while you're there, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to smash that like button. So under this seat is where we place most of the electrical components that make up the big electrical system of this van. So I installed it in the living room under this seat so it would be easily accessible for us to isolate, change fuses, or replace things if ever necessary. So to access this box, you can just lift open the lid here and you've got full access to all the switches and fuses. If you want to get a better look though, the top lid comes off. And then this whole seat actually pulls up. That gives you better access to the back of this component tree where all the wires are kept and the battery if we ever needed to replace it because it is quite tight in there. So I've drawn up our complete electrical diagram. So I'll jump into the screen and try and explain it all as best I can. Right, let's go. So this is the complete electrical system in our van to as much detail as I possibly could. It's basically broken down into three key components, which is our power in, our storage and distribution, and then our power out or our loads. So let's start off with our storage and distribution. Our battery bank is a 135 amp hour lithium deep cycle battery. And the reason why we chose a lithium battery over a lead acid battery is they just are so much better in terms of amount of energy they will store, allowable discharge, and even weight. They do cost a little bit more, but it's gonna save you in the long run, trust me. So from there, we have our negative and our positive terminals. So to start off on the positive terminal, we've got a direct cutoff switch. So this is a heavy duty 12 volt cutoff switch. That'll cut all the power to our system if I needed to. So in case there is some electrical fault that isn't being caught out by fuses, or there is something I, I need to work on, I can cut the whole power to the system easily. It also, if we really wanted to stall the van for a long time, we can just cut the power completely off. So that goes up to a buzz bar. So I didn't use a typical buzz bar that you can buy from the shop. I had some big thick brass bolts sticking around. So bus bars, they're about 20 bucks. These brass bolts were like a couple of bucks. So they basically work the same way. All my connections are terminaled with eyelets that are soldered onto the cables. And then they all go onto either a negative and a positive bus bar to start with. The negative terminal goes directly to a shunt. So I'm using a battery monitor. It's the Renergy battery monitor. And that really allows you to see what is going on with your battery. I think it's pretty essential to have some form of battery monitor, whether it be just a simple voltmeter and you can use a voltage chart to determine the percentage charge of your battery. It's not as accurate. So we went with a full battery monitor, which tells you how much charge your battery has, how much in, how much out, the amps, watts, voltage, and it'll also tell you at a certain amount of voltage how much your battery has left in it. For example, if we are using our lights, it'll say at the current conditions, you will have X amount of hours before your battery is depleted. So it's really important to note when you're using a shunt that nothing goes to your negative terminal except the shunt because the way that the shunt measures how much power is going in and out of the battery, it makes sure it has to go through it. So if the shunt is bypassed and something's connected directly to the negative terminal, it won't be measuring any of that in or out voltage. So goes directly to the shunt and then the out of the shunt goes to my negative bus bar. And then that's where I connect everything to. There's a little positive cable that goes from the shunt to the positive. Again, make sure that's on the other side of your switch so you can turn the whole system off. And that gives the battery monitor the ability to measure voltage and also gives it power. So I did use quite heavy gauge wires on these two terminals that go to my bus bars. Uh, that is obviously because that's gonna be where the most current is drawing. So you want your bus bar to have the least amount of voltage drop. 
I'll just let you know now that all the items that I've used in my entire build, I'll link in the description below so you can get the exact same things and you can basically carbon copy this diagram if you want. I'll also make this diagram available in the description below. I'm going to be starting up a website soon where it will also be available, but until then, I'll make sure I'm making this available to you. So on this diagram, I have labeled all the wire sizes and lengths of wire I use, and it's quite important to know the lengths. The American system AWG, or American Wire Gauge, translates to the universal system of just gauge, so that's GA, which is what I've used on this diagram. That can also be converted to the metric system, which is in millimeters. And I'm gonna throw up a screen now of the best conversion that I've found that shows wire gauges, fuse sizes, and the conversion from metric to imperial sizes. The only thing I don't like about this graph is it loses some of its resolution in cable lengths under 1.8 meters. Graphs with higher resolution at short cable lengths can be used for this. And I'll put a link in the description where you can find that diagram. It's actually come in really handy when I'm designing this fan. Okay, so we used four gauge wire to connect it to the bus bars. From there, it goes into my main distribution fuse block. The positive comes up, goes into the positive terminal of the fuse block. The negative goes up, goes into the negative terminal of the fuse block. And I really like this fuse block because it's got blade fuse holders, but it's also got a negative and a positive buzz bar. So all my connections go through that and it just made it really simple. I also wanted all my fuses in one specific location, not spread around the van. So when something does blow, I'll be able to find it a lot easier by just checking one spot. This fuse box also has red glowing lights when one of the fuses is blown, so it makes it a lot easier. So back over to my inputs. My main inputs are solar and alternator power. I didn't connect shore power because we're not planning on staying at really any kind of caravan parks where you plug in your 240 volt shore power. So I didn't really want that. Our main source of power is our solar power. We have 500 watts of solar on our roof. And I put that in another video where I showed the installing. I'll put it right here or here somewhere. And I go through in more detail the voltage and how it's connected. And this is connected in parallel. And I'll go through why I connect it in parallel in a minute. Each solar panel is fused individually with a 10 amp inline fuse. And these are all connected with MC4 connectors. So these are the standard solar connector and they are waterproof, watertight, airtight, and they're generally UV resistant. Because your solar panels are going to be in the elements, you want to make sure that everything is sealed so you don't get corrosion and start losing voltages. So all the negative terminals go to one and all the positive terminals go to another, all with MC4 connectors through this three to one. That then goes to a solar entry gland. So these are glued and sealed to the roof your cables go through these two ports and are tightened with little rubber grommets. So that is how my cable goes into the van itself. That then goes over the top of the roof, down the wall and into where all my electrical systems are kept. So I've used eight gauge wire for that and that's sufficient enough. I did put an extra fuse in to protect the whole electrical system and it's only another 10 amp fuse and also a complete cutoff switch for my solar. So the solar cutoff switch is only really useful if we're going to be doing work on the solar and I want to disconnect it without having to undo the cables. It pretty much stays on all the time, even when we're not using the van because the battery will just get topped up all the time and stay at 100%. So from there, it goes to our DC to DC 50 amp charge controller. So that is where the alternator and the solars are both connected to, and that's how it gets distributed to the battery. This is also the more efficient MPPT charge controller. Because I've connected this in parallel, we have a higher voltage and a lower amperage. For the amount of solar units I've used on our unit, I really didn't have a choice but to connect it in parallel. If I wanted to connect it in series, the amps would have been too high for this unit to run it at. So when I've measured my solar system on a really hot day, we get around about 450 watts at seven amps and 65 volts. So our next source of power is from the alternator. And this is the power that is generated and distributed to our storage bank when the car is driving. 
So it's not actually connected to our alternator, it's connected to the car's starter battery. In our transit van, they sit under the driver's side seat. So it's quite easy to access. You don't have to go into the engine bay. So these are connected with six gauge wires and this is how the whole system is grounded to the car. So the positive terminal has a fuse, then goes to a cutoff switch so I can turn the alternator system off and then goes into the DC to DC charger. The negative terminal has the cable that goes again into the DC to DC charger. Because our transit van actually has a smart alternator, we really needed to find a DC to DC charger rather than a voltage sensitive relay, which is what a lot of older cars can use. And a voltage sensitive relay basically just turns on a switch between your house battery and your starter battery when your car is turned on and the voltage gets, I think it's above 13 volts. With a smart alternator, the voltage varies quite a lot. So that system doesn't work and you need a smart DC to DC charger for the system to work. The other great thing I love about this Renogy DC to DC charger is that it automatically prefers solar energy. So while we're driving and it's a sunny day, it will take most of the energy from the solar panels rather than from the alternator. It saves us on fuel very slightly, but it is a more economic way of charging your battery. And I think that's really great. So the DC to DC charger outputs the positive and the negative. The positive goes through a fuse and then to my positive bus bar. The negative goes to my negative bus bar. From there, it's distributed back to the battery and also to my fuse box. You also wanna make sure that your fuses are connected as close to your power source as possible. That is to protect the battery, the cable, and any equipment that's connected to it. And you always wanna connect your fuses to your positive terminals. So negative fusing only actually protects the equipment itself, whereas positive fusing connects the source and the equipment. So going on to our loads, we've got our AC and our DC loads. The DC loads are anything that's 12 volts and our AC loads are 240 volt stuff. Basically things that we can't power with 12 volt blenders and our laptop chargers. So we always wanna prefer things that are 12 volts because it's much more efficient than converting it to 240 volts. The way that I've set my system up may be a little different to a lot of other people. So most of our units I wanted to switch separately. So that is basically, if the unit itself doesn't have its own switch, I wanted to be able to turn it off. And this is where this switch panel comes in play. And these things are great. They've got five switches, they've got a cigarette lighter 12 volt, and a couple of USB charging ports, as well as a voltmeter, but I don't really need it when I've got my battery monitor. These things also come with fuses, inline fuses. And because I wanted all my fuses in one source, I decided to bypass those fuses, which means I had to run a couple more wires to the actual switch panel itself, but I thought it was much more worthwhile and much neater because I didn't want to have to check the back of things and take more stuff apart if something broke. I've got my negative terminal coming from my negative bus bar to the negative, which basically just powers all these little lights and the USB, and then all my individual positive terminals. So for instance, I wanted to use my electric water pump. My fuse for my electric water pump will be in the fuse block, but that will just go through the switch and then power the water pump. So I can individually switch the water pump on and off. Same goes for the diesel heater and the water heater system. Where I made it slightly different is with our 12 volt fridge. Because the 12 volt fridge generally uses a little bit more amperature, these switches aren't that great for switching slightly high amperature currents because you will start to lose a lot of that current. So the way I set that up is with a 12 volt relay. A 12 volt relay is a way to switch a high current without using an actual on and off switch. Another switch basically tells the unit to open and close the switch to run the current through. And that's basically what I've done here. So you can see this slightly thicker red positive terminal comes from my fuse, goes to the relay. There's a switch in there that opens and closes this direct line and then feeds the fridge. That switch comes from here. So when I wanna turn the fridge on and off, I use the switch panel 
and this positive terminal tells this relay to open and close. There's a thicker negative terminal here that goes to the fridge. Also, the relay has to have negative power, so that's why I've run it there. And I think that's just a much better way to switch a fridge on and off, or anything that has a higher amperature with a small switch. The other units that have their own built-in switch or don't need them, I didn't run them through the switch panel. So that's something like our roof vent fan. It's got its own switch in it and also the USB ports all around the van. I didn't need to be able to turn those off. Our roof lights, we have six of them and they're on three different circuits. So we've got front, middle and back. And I just connected them together with a household three switch. So it's quite easy to do. So for the bulk of my 12 volt loads, I used a roll of 100 meters of 12 gauge wire. A lot of that was probably an overkill for the amount of current that I needed, but it's a lot simpler to use one wire if you can buy it in bulk, and better than trying to find the most matched wire gauge to your amperage. It just makes the whole system a lot more convenient and simpler and easier to design. So I really only used about three or four different gauges of wires. Down to the AC loads. So this is our 2000 watt Renergy inverter. I won't show you exactly how I've wired this in because legally I wasn't allowed to in Australia. I had to get a licensed electrician to wire in my inverter. If I was to leave my inverter the way it was without any extra things coming out of it, it would be fine. But because I wanted extra power points around the van, I had to run cable and then have the electrical system protected with a proper circuit breaker. I'm not capable of doing that, so I had to get a certified electrician in. But essentially it goes from the power outlet of the inverter to a circuit breaker and then distributed to my three power points around the van. The other thing to note is that you don't want to connect your inverter directly to your battery, which is what a lot of the manuals will tell you. But you want to be sure that you're not doing that if you're running a shunt because you want to be able to measure the voltage going in and out when you're using your inverter as well. And if you connect it directly to your terminals, you won't be able to see it. So under the bed here is where the 2000 watt inverter is. There's another power point here. And then that's also the circuit breaker. So that is wired in by an electrician. I didn't do this because I'm not competent. So this is turned on and off with a remote switch in the cabin. So we don't actually have to come down here really at all. You also wanna make sure that these wires are as short as possible because they are running a very high current. This 2000 watt inverter at 12 volts runs about 160 amps. And I also included an inline breaker. Because I didn't want to use a expensive 250 amp fuse, if it did break, they are quite expensive to replace. So this breaker is resettable. I've only had it set off once when I put way too much load at one time through the inverter and the breaker popped but it was way better than having to burn out my wires or potentially hurt the inverter or my battery. If you do have any questions, remember to leave them in the comments. I will make another video just answering people's questions, comments about the electrical system. I'll try to be as detailed as possible to help anyone out. If you like this video, remember to hit the like button down below. That'll really help us out. Subscribe if you wanna see more videos like this, but until next time, we'll see you later.